Hello, this is Father Dave Mix on the Padre Peregrino podcast. I am live from Lourdes, France right now. And as I was walking the streets with my pilgrimage group, as some of you know, I've been a chaplain for a group going to the Marian shrines of France and Spain and Portugal. None of you, my donors are paying for it. It's paid for by the uh, other pilgrims. I'm just a chaplain on this trip. But as I was walking through Lourdes, I met an American who is also a Catholic hermit under Canon 603. And as many of my enemies always make fun of me saying a Catholic hermit shouldn't travel, I was shocked to meet a Catholic hermit who understands, because he's an Eastern Catholic, that there is a history of traveling hermits in the East and even a bit in the West. So I'm very excited to introduce Brother John the Baptist. He is from New England. And one of the amazing things about him, that another strange coincidence between his life and mine, is he has on his habit zone the way of St. James. He's actually been walking uh, for over a month across Europe. And I would say one of the main themes to my blog and podcast is Elijah, Jeremiah, and uh, St. James who went to Spain. This is the whole reason why I called my, uh, my charity Peregrino Hermitage Limited. Obviously that sounds oxymoronical. Peregrino means traveling, hermitage means you're stable. But it turns out that the stability of a contemplative life can also include wandering. And Brother John the Baptist is gonna give us a little history of both East and West uh, to tell us about that. So brother, um, good to meet you. Enchanté, as, he, uh, as the French say. Enchanté. It's a pleasure, Enchanté, pleasure to, uh, to have met you and uh, it's, been, it's been great in this short time. So uh, first I'd like to talk about church history and specifically saints that have, have done this sort of thing, so on and so forth. Um, but eventually I'll get more specific in the East, right? But for right now, let's start with church history. Okay, so church history, hermits have always wandered and traveled. It always comes around one subject. It's always out of necessity for good of the church. Uh, for instance, for instance, we have St. Anthony of the Desert. He's really big in the East and, and the West. Mm -hmm. um, he had to travel to find different... Um, different hermitages, more uh, conducive for monastic life. Also, there are many, uh, for him to support himself, he would weave baskets from palm leaves and so on and so forth. So for him to sell those, he had to go to the market every once in a while. Uh, he didn't go very often, but he did go. But uh, he he lived mostly a contemplative, cloistered, uh, not cloistered, but hermetical life alone until needs of the church showed up mm -hmm. needs of the church he was asked to be uh or i should say others asked him and he kept saying no 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 i want to stay in my own hermitage he's a very humble humble saint but uh eventually needs of the church saint athanasius the bishop uh in um egypt there um alexandria sorry he was the bishop archbishop i believe of alexandria uh, he was bugged and bugged and bugged, um, St. Anthony was, to, to, to leave and found Cenobitic monasteries, um, even though he just wanted to live quietly as a hermit the rest of his life. So he did travel uh, from hermitage to hermitage and monastery to monastery because he became the, the abbot. Uh, that doesn't really uh, explain totally what we're um, talking about here but it's a small primer and it segues us into what we're about to talk about. Okay, so we also have in the West, there are also two, one started out as an active monastic, uh, well, I would say more uh, mendicant, but became, became a monastic. Um, St. Francis of Assisi, that's gonna come as a shock to most people, but you can actually check he was a very, very, very active, a monk of the marketplace, he used to call himself. Um, he, at the end of his life, most people don't know, but he actually became a hermit. Um, and at the end of his, for those that may not believe, if you go to a PDF file or Google uh, the rule of St. Francis, three quarters down, almost to the end, he has what in the East we would call a hesychistic rule, but it's rule of hermits. He said um, that it is possible 
for Herm, it's, it's very short, but mm -hmm. he said it is possible uh, in his exhortation to his brothers to be a hermit and live an active lifestyle. Why, why is that, how is that possible? Well, we know because there is the conventuals now. They live more of a cloistered life, but they also have, they're able to emerge and do a little bit of a, um, a little bit of evangelism, so on and so forth. We actually have them here in Lourdes. I live right near them. Um, and like you said to me when we were talking, brother, nobody really stops a Franciscan and says, what are you doing outside of your monastery? Exactly. Because exactly. there's been a history of 800 years of understanding that the contemplative life can overflow into the evangelical life. And it always, I think it always, uh, as we have seen in church history, it always, and I could give you, uh, I will actually give you other citations, but. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us a little bit about St. Basil's rule there. Oh, St. Basil, well, I would also like to say mm -hmm. before that one caveat, uh, St. Benedict, uh, the St. Benedict, he was a traveling uh, monastic uh, because of one needs of the church and uh, necessity, uh, Monte Cassino. He didn't just show up at Monte Cassino uh, and say, this is gonna be a monastery. He traveled around with uh, his uh, chauffeur, I guess we'll say chauffeur, uh, one of the smaller monastics that would help him carry it because he was getting older. And out of uh, necessity, he, he started in Subiaco and Nursia, his hometown, Nursia, mm -hmm. Subiaco, and some bad things happened in Subiaco uh, I, I think it was natural disaster. I could be wrong. I'd have to research that again. I really care about the history, not so much about you know right. earthquakes and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but Mon Monte Cassino was founded by St. Benedict in time of his life when he was a traveler. Mm. Most people won't believe that. St. Francis of Assisi, he, uh, he has a rule for monks in his general rule. Mm -hmm. So look that up if, uh, if anyone has any interest. Um, and let's segue into St. Basil the Great. Um, so we have saints like two in the West that I just gave. And also we have St. Anthony of the Desert. Um, also we have St. Mary of Egypt. Most Western Catholics may not know of her. She was also- My listeners all do because I've done podcasts on her. She, yeah. she was 100% a hermit, 100% a hermit. And Zosimus, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm sure some know the story. Uh, brings me to tears every year. So in the Eastern yeah. Rite, we read the canon, uh, not the canon, the Akathist, uh, which is essentially intercessory prayers asking for her intercession. It's during the time of Lent because her whole life is about repentance and gorgeous. But anyways. Because uh, rarely in East or West does a saint get an entire Sunday, especially in a privileged season know, like during the, the Great Fast. So, so she's clearly an, ex an extremely yeah. important saint if, uh, if she can trump a Sunday in Lent or Sunday in the Great, the great Fast, yes. as they say in the East. Our liturgical year, uh, she gets her own uh sunday and also there's two times in lent that we uh we call it the lenten triodian uh but there's two times in lent on saturdays and i i think they're both saturdays i'll have to look it up mm -hmm. i guess it depends on the culture where you are right. the greeks the ukrainians but anyways but that's a she's an example of a traveling hermitess yes hermitess uh she traveled uh she anyways let's wandering say, at least maybe uh, so in the East, we call them, uh, the French would call them Fulon de Christ. The Greeks call them Salos. Uh, the Slavs in the, in the Catholic Church would call them Eurodv. What does uh, Eurodv mean? Eurodv, so we're English speakers, so we're gonna use the English term. It's not as beautiful in English, but it's full for Christ's sake. Uh, Holy Fools, it's a whole category fools, yeah. of saints. And just for, again, for people who are wondering what brother, a lot of times when I talk about Eastern Catholics, people say, wait a minute, are they the Orthodox? No, no the, the Eastern Catholics are in union with Rome, um, but they, their, their liturgies and their sacraments look a lot like, say, the Greek Orthodox or the Eastern Orthodox. But again, um, brother here, he's hoping to be ordained one day, but he is a traveling hermit brother of the Eastern Rite churches. Yes. Uh, um, so, so that's, but he, he could, well, actually, here's a better little picture of him. Last night when I saw him, walking across Lourdes, I thought, hmm, I wonder if he's an Eastern Catholic or an Orthodox, because he looks very much uh, like an Orthodox, or maybe we could say an Orthodox looks like him. But anyway, let's talk about um, that first thousand years of Christianity. First thousand years of Christianity, a lot of, uh, a lot of our history, as well as your history, uh, in the, both of our histories, yeah. we're, we're both in communion, but uh, there is that slight cultural difference between the East and the West. So obviously we know that, but uh, there is, um, I'm sure I know in the West and the East, uh, we both know St. Basil the Great, 
Mm -hmm. And St. John Chrysostom, most people don't know. St. John Chrysostom, I believe, doctor of the church, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't know. One, he's a doctor of the church. St. Peter's the Great, most people don't know. He's actually a Greek Catholic saint. Mm. <laughs> most people think he was Latin, right? He actually mm -hmm. was not. He was pre-schism, uh, mm -hmm. 1054, 10, yes, 10, yeah, that's when the schism was, 10, yeah. uh, 1054. Now, the reason uh, I knew he was Eastern is because my sister is Eastern Rite Catholic, and they, they alternate between the two d divine liturgies of those two saints, St. John Chrysostom and St. Saint, and Saint Basil yes, the Great. Yes. So, and then but I think you're right. There's probably Western Catholics who think he lived in the West for some reason. Uh, I actually thought that for a long time um, uh, just because the West venerate him so much. Yeah. Uh, but the Liturgy of St. Basil is very much like the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, very beautiful. But anyways, mm -hmm. I'd like to specifically talk about uh, his, in layman's terms, in an English-speaking world, the rule of St. Basil the Great is actually called, in English, uh, they originally called it the rule for uh, a synovium, or the rule for monasteries. Uh, it does have a caveat or, or an explanation for hermits, but it, it really started out as just for monasteries, but there are uh, an explanation for rule for hermits too. Okay. Uh, it's about three quarters of the way down um, because synobium always flourish more because it's easier to be in a community than it is a hermit. Um, right. I think we all know that. Living alone, man shall not live alone. But, but there's know, also more I have my brother Hermit here, or <laughs> exactly. father Hermit. But anyway. Well, but there, and there's more danger. You usually had to prove yourself, at least in the West, you can correct me on these. In the West, you had to prove yourself for uh, about seven to ten years. Yeah, communal living. Communal living, one, because people are annoying to each other, but two, it's also dangerous for chastity uh, to yes. be on your own, of course. Um, and and uh, St. Uh, Saint Anthony the Great of Egypt. Um, he used to say, actually it says in the Psalms too, uh, the, the mishap and the demon at noonday, it's in Psalm 90 or Psalm 91, depending on where you're, mm -hmm. uh, I think we would say Psalm 91. Most, most of my listeners are on the Latin Mass when the, the Orthodox or Easterns are on. Yeah, I, I think it's Psalm 91. Okay. He who dwells in the shelter most high. So anyways, uh, mishap and the demon at noonday, mm -hmm. uh, Saint, uh, Saint Anthony the Great talks about how being a hermit the demons so restless cares and restless worries at noonday uh, when we're tired when we've been at work for a long time uh, usually in the evening and we start to get tired we've had lunch so on and so forth uh, restless cares and restless worries so sometimes the hermit when they're early on uh, like the only reason I am approved as a hermit literally the only reason is I had to do a few years in the monastery mm. um, I had to do communal living, and before that, I I, I was in the military. So the, the bishop said, "Okay, well, he's lived in community for quite a few years now." Uh, so yes, you have seven to ten years, I think it's about roughly. Uh, but life experience, like Saint Paul, not the Saint Paul, but uh, in the East we call him Saint Paul the First Monk mm -hmm. or Saint Paul the Sanctified. Uh, he was a monk that became a monk very very late in life. He was a very old man. Um, but the reason why he was approved was he uh, had lived in community for most of his life. Right. I think in the military, there were a few other things he did. Uh, it was in Egypt or uh, Egypt, he was Palestine. Under, he was under Anthony the Great, right? Uh, Anthony the Great, um, before almost before he died. So he was a very old right. man, right? But uh, obviously, he was able to. Uh, but anyways, so he, did you finish on? Uh, I wanted to ask you about the Hesychus, the different levels of yes. monastery, holy fool. Did you finish on? Before we get to that, did you finish on Saint Francis and Saint Basil? Can we move on to that, or do you? Have yes, any, I, I wish. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not a computer monk or a computer <laughs> hermit, so I wish I could give you. It, it's great if you research those. Uh, the rule for uh, uh, what I was going to say, Saint Francis of Assisi, in his the end of his rule where it talks about rule for hermits mm -hmm. uh it's actually a rule for hesychus well, in the east we would call a rule for hesychus and you're uh, going to tell us in a minute what that means yes hesychus i will tell you in a minute what that means but essentially a segue into that is in his rule for hermits he did not want hermits to just be alone just one hermit he did what was called hesychism it's two to three to four it's traditionally three to four mm -hmm. monks uh, hermit, sorry. Um, the pinnacle number is usually three. Four is getting a little. Four and five is a little too many. 
That's just become a synobium. And are they, are they only in different cells, or do they even have they little have different cabins? Different cabins different, or different, different cells? It can either those be... Those are two different things. I've only heard of, with Hesychism and Orthodoxy, as mm -hmm. well as in Roman Catholicism, as well as traditionally mm -hmm. in, in ancient times, Hesychism, for it to work and for you to be a valid hermit, you have to have separate cabins. We separate would call cabins, them, yeah. We would call them separate cells, but really what they are is separate cabins. Mm -hmm. If you're living in one building uh, and everyone just has a separate room, that's really just a synobium. Synobium. Um, so does everyone get that? Uh, community. So synobium is you got one big monastery. Hesychism is separate cabins, and I assume in in um, Hesychism, you come together for either Vespers or Divine Liturgy, Holy Mass, whatever, occasionally yes. a few times a week. So you only have, I mean, you could have two priests, but usually, so mm -hmm. who is a Hesychist? St. Charbel McClough of the Maronite Rite, he was a Hesychist. Uh, he had to build that, build up to that. He lived in community, yeah. and then he was approved as a hermit. But he did not live alone. He lived in separate cabins, and he was the priest uh, in this hesychistic okay. life that would, uh, so one is the Martha, and he one was, is the Mary. By the way, he was, he was uh, Lebanese, Lebanese, so he's greatly, yeah. he's greatly loved by West and East both. In fact, when I travel, in France. yeah, and when I travel around Mexico, I cannot believe how many Mexicans have a, uh, a great devotion to uh, St. Charbel. Yes. It shows you don't actually have to go through the United States. We're so uh, uh, US-centric, you travel and you're like, ah, people didn't have to learn about St. Charbel from an American priest, they already knew about him. Uh, yes. from Lebanon straight to Mexico. So, uh, so I've actually been confused with Maronites here uh, mm -hmm. because I do have an Eastern tinge and that's totally fine with me because uh, St. Charbel was great, St. Oh, with this, We so got this so Western uh, thing right here though. But St. James, of course, all the apostles, yes, yes. all the apostles would have uh, understood it, that all apostolic traditions are supposed to be in union, but that's a podcast for a different time. Okay, so back to the Hesychist, uh, and tell us about so, these four levels. So Hesychist, I'm going to start with first. Uh, right. But a what good, you, you're giving us the four levels of what, though? Just so uh, can... Of monasticism. So in the East, we see monasticism as... Uh, I, I really don't want to use the word fluid. Uh, mm -hmm. No, 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 not mm -hmm. fluid. We see it as different vocations, but... One is drastically different from the other, but there's four levels. But yeah. first, I want to talk of Hesychism. Uh, just to wrap that up. Hesychism is, it should be about three, but three to four monks. Um, usually, they've ascended to the rank of hermit, or they are um, they are about to become uh, approved as a hermit, and they just lived with other hermits to learn the life. Yeah. But they're really not living together. They live, they yep. have separate right. cabins that they come together in one cabin uh, or one small house for liturgy, and then they spread out to their own cave, their own cabin, mm -hmm. or their own mount. Some of them have different mountains in Palestine and mm. in Lebanon and Syria where they, one has their own little mountain, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, they come, come together off the mountain. Like St. Mary of Egypt, uh, mm -hmm. she would go out, um, she met Zosimus, St. Zosimus. Um, because he was out for his 40 day journey during Lent. And uh, and then they would come back into communion uh, or back into their community and so on and so forth. And as you give but us it, this, this hierarchy, are you going from less I'm ascetical? Going, are you going from less ascetical to more or more ascetical to so less? So I am just a sinner. So I, I have not ascended to the rank, I don't think, to, uh, I am approved as, um, Kind of like a hermit fool, but anyways. By a Western bishop, by the way. But we won't uh, well, by by ritual, by, by ritual. ritual bishop, uh, yeah. So he, he's both. He's by ritual of uh, Eastern. I'm not going to say the right because uh, um, I'd like to kind of keep this. Yeah, we got gotcha. you. Non-personal. Yeah. More about church history yeah, and church not history. about self. Yeah. But anyways, uh, so Hesychistic is essentially hermits, and the only reason they. They, they really don't live together, but they do live together, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's necessity, like like you. Why are you out traveling and evangelizing? Necessity of the church, you are asked to, either by the Holy Spirit or by a bishop. Me, I'd love to stay in my hermitage. I, I'd love to have, well, I, I love the route of Saint Jacques or the way of Saint James, but I was asked to evangelize. So, okay, uh, 
the needs of the church there are in America there are not so many young monks anymore uh, so they pull from from young hermits whoever they can find to fill the ranks go out and evangelize I don't care if you're a hermit you're the young one go so needs of the church it's always been that way with St. Anthony of Egypt and uh, moving from Subiaco to Monte Cassino with uh, St. Benedict so, so on and so forth but I'm going to start with what the East, it's not my interpretation, but what the East would call the lesser, um, it doesn't mean that you're not holy at these yeah. lesser levels, but you... We'll say less intense, even though that we, less we would never, intense. We would never yeah. put that I, as I a, wouldn't say lesser, no, it's not, but... It's not, a, it's not a canonical term, obviously, less intense, but just just for listeners in a, in a shortened podcast, we'll start yes. with less intense and move to more Here's intense. a good one. It doesn't mean better uh, or worse. There are such thing as apostles named... Uh, St. James the Lesser and St. James the Greater. There you go. Does that mean that uh, one was greater or one was, well... Mayor in Spanish. Just yes and, yes and no. Yeah. Uh, I would say they were both, that uh, they both became martyrs, right? Yep. So, uh, both martyrs, saints, apostles. I would say they both just as sanctified. But the reason uh, one was the lesser, one was greater, I think it was, what was it? Because one was the brother of the Lord. Not not actually his brother, but he was actually more cousin. Like a yeah. cousin. Yeah. because uh, the virgin was fully And the one who came to Spain where I just came from and where our brother just came from, that's obviously Saint James the Greater. Yes. Uh, who um, was the brother of Saint John the Apostle, known as the Sons of Thunder. Can you imagine if Jesus Christ himself named you and your brother Sons of Thunder? You take you feel like you take on oh, the yeah, world. Yeah. Uh, the the sons of uh, Zebedee? Zebedee? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but they they say uh, Saint James the Greater was uh, the brother of the Lord, meaning he was just he was a not just, but he was a cousin, yeah, not yeah, not uh, any then the brother of John. Yeah. Um, so obviously the Virgin was immaculate from beginning to end. So sure. she didn't have any other children, Amen. obviously. Amen. Uh, but uh, yeah, I want to start start with the less intense of these levels. There are four we and believe maybe, in the sorry, East. brother, and maybe tie in as you go <laughs> through these why some of them would travel. Okay, uh, so we're gonna start at the lesser level, and like I said, you know, lesser. We're just gonna use that term because uh, in the East we really don't. We put them in a rank structure, but we really don't say one's lesser or one's greater. Right. But uh, we're gonna start with um, the synobium first. Uh, we always see the synobium as we call it the school of monasticism. So it's where everyone has to start, unless. You're Saint Mary of Egypt, mm. and we don't even worry about that because she was taught what she. Uh, how did you learn? Saint Zosimus said, "How did you learn mm -hmm. all these scriptures? Where did you read this?" She had only read the scriptures twice in her whole life, I believe it was. It was the Holy Spirit that taught her. So, uh, but anyways, uh, we start with the monastic uh, monasteries or the Snobium first. Um, Essentially, they have a vow of stability, so they they really they only leave to go to the market, get food, so yeah. on and so forth. Uh, but in the east, there is more traveling and monasticism. Why? Uh, even with the hermits, why? Because it's not like America. It's even still to this day in Lebanon, the monks don't have people to ascend and descend the cave monasteries mm. in the mountains of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. They do it themselves. Uh, Abba Piamin, he he worked and would peddle those those baskets. He was one of the desert fathers in Palestine. Uh, he would peddle his own things, uh, his his own baskets and mats that he would weave himself, uh, so that he could eat uh, and other so on and so forth. Uh, so there was a lot of traveling. It was always out of necessity, but there were monks that uh, all throughout these ranks and hermits that traveled. But usually when they travel for evangelism, it's because a bishop said, I don't care if you're a hermit. We need you to do this because you have the gift of preaching. You mm -hmm. may be a hermit, but uh, I'm your bishop. I'm your approving bishop. You need to go and do this. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. This is more in the East, but in the West, I gave you some, um, uh, you know, some other instances. There are others, but... This is kind of spur of the moment. Yeah, I just so grabbed him I, off the streets when I met him, so I think he's doing great. But but anyways, uh, we'll, we'll try to wrap it up in thirty minutes. So if you want to, if you want to, we're about twenty-four yes. minutes. So so after the monasteries, the synobium or the synobitic lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, so you have monasteries. These are all gradual. You have to almost always ninety-nine percent always got to start at the lowest level. 
uh, priests, uh, Diocesan priests are not, is it, this is, they're, they're not monastic. They're not, they're very holy, like St. John Marie Vianney, the Baptist, but they're, they're not a monastic level. Mm -hmm. So, you mm -hmm. know, I love them very much, but they're not included here uh, because it's not a monastic right. level. Uh, so we have the monasteries. Then we have Hezekism. Uh, so Synovium, and that's what we talk Hezekism. about. The, this is the cabin sort of. This is someone that wants to be a hermit, but it's more appropriate. So the way it was explained in the the rule of Saint Francis, especially his Hezekistic viewpoint on hermits, he he said one must be the Martha, one must be the Mary. Hmm. So there are people that will like like us. We will be hermits alone. I am not a Hezekist. I am a hermit alone, but mm -hmm. asked by my, uh, uh, I guess, superiors, uh, bishop, so on, would you like to go uh, evangelize? Yes, I would. Okay, bam. Here we are in Lourdes. But uh, uh, next we have the hesychism. I kind of beat that one to death. That's like three or four monks that, uh, because of the Martha and Mary situation, one's a servant and one says mass. The other one, kind of like the Carthusian order. Uh, St. Bruno started that. They live together, but he started that. Mm. Everyone has their own different cabin in their, mm. their locked doors. Um, but they live together. They never talk, but they're very, very, very separated. Very separated. Um, but within a monastery. Um, the purpose is so one can be the Martha, one be the Mary. So they can live as hermits, but it's not as difficult as being a solo hermit. Because it is like, mm. it's the third rank. So now next, so you have your Cinnabitic monasteries mm -hmm. or just a monastery in general, uh, then your Hezekism. So I'm going to go to the third tier. Third tier out of the four is what we are. We are hermits approved by our bishops, uh, either either a soft uh, a soft blessing or Canon 603. Mm -hmm. really doesn't matter uh, as much in the East, Canon 603. Yeah, we, we both happen to be under 603. But yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Both. Yes, yeah, even but, though he's uh, a brother, I'm a priest. We're both but, hermits under 603. Who traveled? He's going to get to that. Uh, but there are separate canons for the East. But for me, yeah. I really did not have to be under an Eastern canon because mm -hmm. I have a bi-ritual bishop. Gotcha. So he does the Western uh, canons um, as well as the Eastern, so on and so forth. And what's the category number three we're talking about? What's the name of that? We are talking about hermits in general. Okay, just in general. Uh, mm -hmm. Hermits... My apologies. You have to keep redirecting me because I <laughs> uh, right. there's a lot that needs to come out in a short amount of time. Uh, so he, Father does a really good thing about redirecting me back on the topic. Because <laughs> I'll talk about church history and saints all day, but he's like, "Hey, let's stick to topic," because he is our loving uh, directive father, uh, the shepherd of the flock, and I do need a shepherd. But anyway. Uh, so third I'm tier. I'm going to talk about something where I was very. Well, I'll just say it now. Um, <laughs> when we were walking through the streets, uh, brother here, he's not going to like me uh, sharing this because. Uh, I know what you're going to say, but I really did not. Uh, we anyways, didn't. We you didn't can know say you're the priest. So well, you there was a, there was a man walking through uh, the streets of Lords with no shoes, and brother went chasing after him uh, to give him his own shoes, and I mean that's that's a real indication to me that he's not just studying church history; he's actually living it. And I was very moved by that. The, the gentleman happened to not <laughs> not want the shoes, but brother already had them off of his feet as he gave them. <laughs> I don't blame him. They were so dirty. I got them in like halfway through France on my walk. So, he... But we were going to leave. I'm going to, you know, of course, brother doesn't have like a, a website or anything like, like I do. Um, and I'm, I'm very convicted of that too. We have different roles in the church, of course. But um, I will have him tell you the church to Google where you can put in Brother John of Baptist yes. if you'd like to send him a letter or donate. Actually, as long as we're on this topic, why don't you just tell us, um, uh, so don't, it, don't give the address, maybe just tell what church to Google. And then if you want to send him a letter or a donation, you can just put Brother John the Baptist and they can find the address of the church if they Google. Yes. Um, so uh, I'd like to say, pardon me, I, I, I have a vow of poverty, so I, I, I don't really have a cell phone. Uh, but you could, uh, you could Google one of my best friends is, uh, I'm actually uh, anchoritically attached to um, a parish uh, actually named after Lords. It's Our Lady Lords in uh, Pittsfield, New Hampshire. Um, so I'm under that uh, uh, anchoritically attached, meaning I'm not in the parish, I'm not in the rectory, but I, I was given uh, 
land owned by that parish uh, to use, not to own, but to use uh, through providence of Christ. Uh, it's land owned by the parish uh, and in, in the bishop uh, through the diocese has allowed me to set up a little hermitage on that land. Um, and it's beautiful. And so we don't get uh, his parish in trouble since I'm seen as kind of controversial. Just ever know this is Father Dave Mix's podcast, not uh, under under no approbation or connection to Our Lady Lords in uh, New Hampshire. Both of us are in good standing, but um, we just met on the streets and this is just an interview. So, yes. uh, um, but you can write him, brother, uh, at that parish, Our Lady Lords, Pittsfield, New Hampshire. But okay, we got to wrap this up. So get back I, to. I the... neither endorse nor oppose <laughs> any. Yeah, anyway. Exactly. Uh, so the fourth and final one that is not seen actually it is seen in the west but not much but is very very popular and this is the fourth after hesychism so you have monasteries i, I mean uh monasteries hesychism mm -hmm. hermits fourth tier and final tier we add a fourth one because we believe the holy spirit totally and fully in, envelops um drum roll please for number four. people this is uh, the highest level i'm gonna say it in english first uh, but for the sake that I just don't like how it translates in English because it's not as beautiful, uh, is a fool for Christ's sake. Uh, in the West, there are a few. So you already heard of St. Mary of Egypt. She was blessed as a fool for Christ's sake. You really don't get formally, in the East, there's not as much formal blessing. Yeah. You're just seen uh, and approved uh, by a bishop by just... Uh, he he discerns whether it's from the Holy Spirit, like St. Paul says, or not. And like, uh, I know before we hit record when we were walking the streets and even now, you had an allergy to the word fluidity, but I would agree there's a, there's a fluidity. Because we're Americans, we all know what, what that's yeah. being used oh, right that's now. that's right, I forgot about Gender that. Gender fluid, anyways, yeah, right, moving right. on. We're gonna, moving now, on. You're gonna, now you're going to trip up the algorithms, but oh yeah, well. Yeah, anyways. anyways. Uh, anyways. No, but it's I'm right. a fool, I'm a, a semi-fool. Uh, I'm not as definitely not as holy or as big as any of those fools for Christ's sake. But you're aiming but, for that. But I do aim yeah. and desire to be a little bit more. So Brother John the Baptist, I he was the chief fool for mm. Christ's sake. He was camel's hair, honey, yeah. locusts. Uh, he preached, no matter if it came to his own death. In while well, he was in prison, right. screaming at uh, King um, uh, the King Tetrarch, uh, yeah. King Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee. Um, he didn't care. He knew he was going to die. He knew the Holy Spirit enlightened him. But so anyways. let me let me just distill out what Brother's saying here is that um, in the East there's a certain category of hermit called fool for Christ. Now you don't get a, a canonical stamp on your paper saying you're now a fool for Christ. But in the fluidity of the East, it's actually um, seen as the highest form of the her hermetic life yes. to be to be known and seen as a fool for Christ. Now. John the Baptist is a great example, but probably some people would counter and say, but he at least lived stability next to the River Jordan. Can you name any any fools for Christ in East or West who were, pretty much, were pretty mendicant? Pretty much and all moved? of them. <laughs> yeah, tell, tell me about some that moved around a little uh, bit. Okay, uh, so so St. Benedict Joseph Labre, he's a oh, Western yeah. Roman a Catholic example. saint. He's one of my patron saints. Mm. He was fully canonized. Yeah. Uh, in the East, we don't know him as much, but I know him because I just, I love this class of saints. Uh, I am not that sanctified where I can call myself one of these. I, I, it's I, funny I, that St. Benedict, Benedict Labre is seen as a patron saint of mental illness. Maybe that's how the- mentally ill. No, I, know, I agree with you. Part. I agree with you, brother. Uh, they actually wrote a book. His confessor yep. wrote a book, and when he was canonized, mm -hmm. we can't canonize people that are mentally ill. Uh, like saints, you can still be just to. I know you can still only, be sanctified. You can still be but, sanctified and get to heaven, but yes. that's not. Anyway, you and I, yeah, we're not saying but in the those who are mentally ill can't get to heaven. Fight. That's right. Yeah. And and too many Westerners think because it's too think, difficult to pinpoint whether yeah. it's schizophrenia or is it or is it sanctification. We don't know. It's not that it's not that the not that the it's holy just crazy. <laughs> it's But difficult. anyway, we agree that brother or uh, Saint Benedict Labray was not crazy like no some no think. because his yeah. confessor which was a very prestigious priest uh wrote a whole book of he would he's he had uh lice in his hair he said and he smelled horrible and he wasn't sure if he did that on purpose <laughs> right before he came into the confessional for humility or, mm -hmm. or if it was from sleeping on the streets he said it was probably a little bit of both because he did not want people to, uh, anyways. Now, brother, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding uh, of, of Eastern holy fools is 
one of the requirements, even before you're looking at canonization, one of the requirements for identifying a holy fool on the streets is, oh, and let me finish, yeah, that they, they, um, they have to know they're messing with you, so to speak. They, it can't be that they're crazy. This is very difficult. Uh, yeah. It's the most difficult thing in the church, and there are a few podcasts on explaining this. Uh, the Orthodox talk about them a little bit more, but the Eastern Rite talks about them a lot too. You can find they're not actually crazy. No, they're, no, they're no, mortifying no. their own will and they're mortifying other people's. But will. Uh, not every person, um, not every person that acts this way is a fool for Christ's sake. But That's right. you need to be able, so the way it was explained to me is you need to be able to see the gospel in it. Mm. It needs to be with love. They can be shouting at the top of their lungs. Mm -hmm. But it can't be in an angry manner. It's it's for correction. It's for, uh, fool for Christ's sake are usually seen, it's, it's to urge you on the gospel, but yeah. it's usually for correction. I have seen in my own life, I'm not going to name names because I don't want people to, uh, he, Anyways, well, it's, uh, for, it's for convic conviction's a really good word. I mean, I have um, met one that uh, <laughs> yelled at a priest uh, because a priest was doing something very wrong, and the priest could see the sanctity of this person uh, that he was about to yell back, and he realized who he might be yelling at, mm. and he immediately stopped doing the wrong thing he was doing. And it wasn't it wasn't the fool for Christ yelling at him. It was that this man had so much conviction from the Holy Spirit, and it wasn't anger. It wasn't. Uh, sometimes they'll come as very humble, but mm -hmm. other times they have a gift from the Holy Spirit to be able to tell how to come off on this person. Right. Um, and this person so happened to be very hard of heart because the priest job is very difficult. And this this priest had been very had seen a lot of death. He was I, in uh, destruction in his own country, mm. so he became very hard. But this priest, uh, I mean, this uh, fool for Christ's sake, was able to urge him on in the gospel by by being rough, the way he would understand it the most, because he was Slavic Catholic. So you know, sometimes we can be a little hard of hard in the head too. Uh, but I, anyways, yeah, so, no, that's really good, brother, and uh, I think. I think the key to um, a holy fool for Christ, and uh, you told me on the streets, the Russian is Euro Divi. I think the key, or one of the keys, one of their gifts is that they convict your conscience. But yes. his brother said it's done in charity. And so, like, there was a time in my life. Sometimes, I, yeah, sometimes it's very loving and humble. But yeah, sorry I mean, there, no, there was a time in my life when I had a lot more apostolic-based um, poverty zeal. And when I saw you run off, uh, chasing the man with no shoes, taking your shoes off to give it to him, you could have looked like another crazy person just, you know, chasing down a, a homeless man. But for me, it was a great conviction, as as St. John writes in the Apocalypse, to return to your first love. Um, and so conviction is is one of the great gifts. Conviction of other people's conscience is, is apparently how God works through the Holy Fool for Christ's heart in the lives of other people and again that was uh, very convicting when i just saw you chase him down with your shoes as i said earlier he didn't take them but um that's that was a very beautiful thing for me to see that that really uh gave compunction to my own heart to to return to my attempts at that at one point in my life it uh and i thought he was you know uh so i i asked my aim you know i'm a hermit but my aim is to be more like a fool for christ but it's, it's not something that happens overnight, except it has happened with maybe one or two saints, but very, 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 very difficult for it to be overnight. It's a lifelong self-denial. Usually someone's a hermit or a monk for a long time. And then, so for instance, uh, um, anyways, I asked advice one time and I said, Father Confessor, I was very young and I, I said, Father, I'd love to be like a fool for Christ's sake, maybe 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. And it's not something you just become. It's actually totally a gift from the Holy Spirit. Mm. You don't say, I'm just going to work towards this. No, it's 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 a vocation. It's either in you or it's not. Um, but I didn't understand that at that time because I was very young, uh, early 20s. But he said, uh, if it is in you and it's a call from the Holy Spirit, you'll know and it'll, it'll work out. But I said, 
well, what about being treated like you're, you're nuts all the time? And, uh, you know, you get venerated sometimes too, but uh, we don't want that either because that, that can actually throw you off the holiness track. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, you know, how do I cope with being spit on or being made fun of all the time? And that's the life of, of, uh, of a fool for Christ. He said, uh, a true fool for Christ will not care at all. <laughs> will not care. Right. Uh, like St. Right. Benedict Joseph Elaborate, he loves his fellow brethren uh, and fellow sisters, but he, it'll be the furthest thing from his mind because. And this is like the, the perfect joy of St. Francis of you know, what would be the perfect joy if we, if we arrived at this other Franciscan cabin at night and they looked at us, laughed at us and beat us and said, you're not real Franciscans. That's, that would be heaven. That would be heaven for St. Francis. Yeah. Um, so here we are. We'll just wrap this up. Let me just summarize uh, brother's life. Brother John May the I Baptist. May I say one yeah. thing real quick? Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> I just want to say some names of uh, a Fool for Christ oh, yeah. uh, for people you can research. Great. Okay, so uh, there are some pre-schism um, that... Uh, I say pre-schism because it was a really long time ago. Yeah. Uh, Orthodox and Catholics love them. St. Simeon of Emesa, Emesa in Syria. Uh, uh, who else? Uh, was he stable or, or not stable mentally? I mean, did he travel or was he... Uh, was, he we're talking no, about two types he, of stability so here. He has, did he travel? He had no vow of stability. His mm. whole life... So fools for Christ's sake are hermits. And they are make no make no uh, uh, distinction between it. Like they are literally, they are definitely hermits. They don't even really they usually don't be, talk to. They can to have anyone. stability or mobility. Um, stability, mobility. But Saint Simeon of Emesa, he would travel um, uh, from Syria to all these different places to urge people on in the gospel. There are many stories, but I can't go uh, can't go on. Uh, uh, one that is Orthodox, but has been approved by the Pope for veneration. Uh, cause he, um, it, the Patriarch of Moscow actually, uh, came and they, they had an apostolic visit in Cuba four years ago or so, uh, for veneration from, uh, in the Catholic church. Um, uh, but he is original Russian, Russian, but, uh, he has been approved in the Catholic church, uh, not canonized in the Catholic church, but approved for veneration at a lower level. Uh, um, St. Seraphim, Seraphim Asarov. Mm. Uh, many Roman Catholics know him. Um, there is St. Basil of Moscow. Uh, he's in the East. We venerate him already because um, some of these saints transcend. Uh, they didn't really see the schism. Mm. They, they were neither Orthodox nor Catholic. Mm -hmm. they, they, this rank of saints really transcends, um, transcends that. They would uh, see themselves as Orthodox, but they didn't spend time ripping on Catholics. They, when they met Catholics, they, they didn't really see the distinction of uh, communion, non-communion. Because uh, how do I know? Because they actually spent their life talking about. Um, just they didn't really see the distinction. Um, uh, there's also one Saint Gabriel of Uzabaji in Georgia near Tbilisi. Um, he did not see the extent. You know, he's. Um, anyways, no, we're good. Keep going. So, uh, so some Roman Catholic ones, uh, St. Simeon of Amasa, he was Roman Catholic, but prior to schism, um, uh, St. Saint, uh, uh, Benno Joseph, or St. Benedict Joseph Labre. Um, I'm really drawing a blank. There's actually a lot of Eastern Rite Catholic ones, um, mostly pre-schism. There are some, oh, um, St. Phil, uh, or... In English, we would say Saint Theophil of the Kiev Kievs, but uh, in Ukrainian, it's Theophil uh, of the Kiev Kievs. He was Roman Catholic. Um, Saint Andrew, fool for Christ's sake. Uh, Abbas Thasia, she was Romanian Catholic. Yeah, there, there, there's a million of them. In some sense, I would, and you know, the very first fool for Christ who names himself at it as that is Saint Paul, who yes. lived this tremendous interior life, probably prayed all night, but but covered the whole world. So he was somewhat of a, a monk missionary. Um, and he describes himself as a fool for Moris dia Christon in Greek. And that is uh, not Thessalonians, that's Corinthians, right? Okay. I, I think believe, so, yeah. That's I believe it's it's in the second half, uh, three quarters of the way, or second half of Corinthians, uh, Two Corinthians, sorry. Yeah, two just Google, Google uh, Fool for <laughs> Christ. All right, well, this has been great. We're going to wrap yeah. this up. So, brother, thanks for joining. So let's just recap. So 
here we have Brother John the Baptist. He's an Eastern Rite Catholic hermit who is both mobile and mendicant, mendicant meaning he begs, um, and his goal in life is to be a fool for Christ. Can you imagine that, putting that on your resume, fool? But that is the downward spiral of the cross to bring us back to the upward spiral of the resurrection. This is where, I mean, simply swimming against the stream of the world, the flesh, and the devil at any point, for any of us, even if you're not, even if you don't have the calling of brother or myself, we're really in this time, I think with St. Anthony, St. Anthony the Great, St. Anthony the Desert said, there will come a time when all the madmen will look at the one sane man and say, that man is crazy. <laughs> and I think we're, we must be in those days uh, where any Christian who not only holds to divine revelation, but even natural law at this point is gonna be called crazy by the adherents of the world. So in some sense, we may be coming up on, who knows, maybe the last times in the church uh, before Christ returns again, whenever that is, whether it's 2023 or 4023, uh, I suspect those last days, um, true Christians will be seen by the world of flesh and the devil, all as holy fools. Is in uh, Book of Revelation, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it says uh, uh, in the end times, uh, evil will be, uh, the evil will be seen as good and the good will be seen as evil. From the Old Testament, but it's, uh, it must be coming up on us. No, you got it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you know, he knows uh, his scripture very well, but like... Uh, just doesn't know his num numbers in. Yeah. <laughs> but he's 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 a living gospel to me. It doesn't matter that he can't quote the numbers because when I saw him again chase after man to give him his shoes, uh, it was it was me seeing the gospel in action and convicted me to return to my first love. So brother, thanks for joining Thank us today. Would, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Would a fool for Christ's sake come out and uh, would he fully quote scripture perfectly? Or would he come out and purposely screw it up so that it puts some humility in it? <laughs> right. I'm not sure. But anyway, no, anyways. Great anyways, question. God bless you.